Greetings fellow fivers, this is Revenge, your fellow no life war hunter. This guide is for those of you who are new to combat related games and actually want to get better in solo hunting. So you might be struggling against certain boss and you don't want to get hard carried by others, right? That yeah, this is the video for you. In my opinion, Monster Hunter World is way more enjoyable once you know more about the technical part of it. I mean, there's a good reason why people are still playing it, right? After 5 years. So yeah, to those of you who are probably done soloing every endgame bosses, you might want to get a better clear time of it, cause uh, why not? You'll probably appreciate the game more, just like me. Disclaimer, this is not actually a speedrun video, but a comprehensive guide that introduces combat mechanics and the general application of it, which generally results in a cleaner hunt. Yeah, without further ado, let's get right into it. Alright, now let's get right into the combat flow of Monster Hunter World, which is similar to most RPG combat games. General stuff like getting close to the monster, dodging attacks and whatnot, you know. Let's look at it from an inexperienced player's perspective. From two perspective patterns, I would like to say, from either an LS main or a non-LS player. Starting with the perspective of an LS newbie, obviously we have to actually get close to the monster before landing attacks, right? In the right distance, you get a land hit on the monster. Then, as monster is attacking you, you have the option to foresight slash. And the problem with uh, LS newbie is that they have over-reliance on foresight slash. They see an attack, they foresight, ignoring there are better options which we will discuss later. And basically, the problem here is the over-reliance on foresight. So the other perspective is a uh, turn-based combat flow. What they do is they get close to monster attack as usual, and then they roll when the monster attacks, which is nothing wrong. But notice how I make it a very small text for the roll. Yeah, there's a reason for that, because they very seldomly roll. This is due to the fact that they assume that it is a DPS loss if they are playing too safe against the monster that don't know too well. So you might as well just keep attacking the monster, right? But what ends up happening is that they get attacked so often and yeah, it, it ends up a DPS loss where they have to keep getting close to the monster, recovering and whatnot. Alright, so as opposed to the newbie combat flow, let's look into the real combat flow. So as usual, you want to get close to the monster. As you're in the right distance, you get to attack the monster. So now you have three different options when the monster are attacking you which is uh, either you reposition by walking, you roll away from the attack, or there's a weapon-specific iframe, guard, or even counter, just like a long swords counter, uh, shield by lance or whatnot. So yeah, okay, now that you have dodged the monster's attack, what happened next is probably that the monster is still nearby, and you get to continue attacking the monster. This is obviously ideal, and the other potential I mean, probability is that the monster repositioned away and you have to get close to the monster again. So yeah, this is actually a loop. When the monster is still nearby, it just goes back to here. So yeah, the monster will attack you again, so you either do one of these three. Or if the monster repositioned away, it get back to here and there. This is not ideal obviously, because uh, you have to get close to the monster once again. And during any part of this process, like during the part where you get close to the monster, there is a chance that you get attacked by the monster and you have to get close to the monster once again. Or if your health is too low, you have to actually shift and heal, heal up. So yeah, this is basically about the real combat flow. So the subsequent part of this guide, we will talk about on how to further optimize the combat flow. Like how to effectively get close to the monster with effective pathing in mind. Then we also have attack window based on monsters openings. Then we also have uh, how to not get hit by monster in general. So yeah, starting with the part of not getting hit by the monster, let's talk about rolling in general. Alright, now rolling is about dodging attacks obviously, which essentially relies on two mechanics, out of hitbox or iframe. Out of hitbox is basically rolling out of the monster's attack, where the hitbox doesn't connect to your hunter. While iframe is also known as um, invincibility frame, is about rolling into the monster's attack and actually not receiving damage from it. Well, there are other forms of iframe, but let's look into the context of rolling for now. So, to actually get out of the hitbox ideally, the hunter should know the size and the active frame of the hitbox. Active frame refers to the active duration of the hitbox, 
let's look into an example that explains everything about it. Alright, let's take Furious Rajang Flying Slam for example. The attack lands on me and my health decreases. Yeah, that's basically common sense, right? But what happens if I roll into the attack? Let's have a look. Here you can see that I roll into the attack. I didn't receive damage when the attack lands into me because there's iframe on my roll. But then again, there's a lingering hitbox on uh, Furious Rajang Flying Slam where the hit frame actually exceeds the iframe of my roll. That's why I receive damage and not being able to dodge the attack. But what happens if we roll out of the attack? So what happens if I actually try to dodge the attack out of it, I mean. So it actually still connects to me because uh, it's a large hitbox, but I'm able to negate the first hit frame due to the iframe on my rolling, right? But as I travel outside, the hit frame is actually still active, but I'm already out of the hitbox, so it doesn't connect to me. And we already established the fact that um, the monkey's flying slam hit frame is more than my iframe, right? So it should attack me if I'm still within the hitbox. So since I traveled out of it, it doesn't connect to me. But actually, monkey's flying slam is a very extreme example to showcase lingering hit frame. Because most attack actually has instant hit frame where you can just roll to iframe it regardless if you are still within the hitbox. Alright, so let's look into some simple examples of iframing monsters' attacks. Right, so besides dodging attacks with roll, there's actually a way to deal with monsters attack by repositioning just by walking preemptively on the ideal spot. So this actually involves uh, monster striking. So what it basically means is that be before a monster does an attack, the monster actually first strike the hunter and then does its telegraph attack movement. To understand this simply, let's look into a fight in a platform game, Mega Man Zero Three for an example. Right, so there are three things to be taken note of during uh, monster striking. The first one would be the moment the hand came out from the boss, this would be the beginning of the tracking. So during the tracking itself, it, the sword actually follows the player as if it would drop down, right? So it's telegraphed in that way. So as you can see, it follows until the end and this is where the tracking ends and it lands on the spot where, it, where the tracking ends. And obviously it takes time to land and yeah, you could kind of escape and attack the boss. Okay, so let's look at it in from a monster hunter view, which is slightly different from what we see here. Alright, so let's look into an ATV fight and how his tracking works. So ATV is in the process of entering into a default state. And right now he's in a default state. This is when the tracking begins and it ends as well. So what it means is that the next moveset will be aimed in here. So yeah, let's see what happens next. It's telegraphed in a way that he will do a tail step the moment he pulls his tail, right? So yeah, the tail step we basically aim at the mansion spot earlier. And I managed to roll at the last second of it. Okay, so what happens next is that the moment he pulls his tail is when the second tracking begins. So the next move set will be aimed in here. So yeah, let's see what happens next. I position out of it by walking. And right in here, I'm in preparation to actually do a helm breaker and it didn't actually connect to me just right beside me and I managed to do a helm breaker right here yeah as you, man as, as you can see before the third one lands like the moment he pulled the tail is when the third tracking begins and he will aim on this spot but while I'm doing the helm breaker my character is actually moving so it doesn't actually connect to me before the attack lands me I mean before the attack lands on this spot So yeah, that's how the tracking works. So yeah, repositioning optimally with monsters tracking in mind is a very advanced technique. After all, unlike Mega Man Zero Three example, you can't actually see where the attack lands, but instead you have to somewhat feel and predict the timing of the monsters tracking and the hitbox position. It is also important to take note that rolling requires recovery animation before hunter get to do anything 
while walking does not. So this suggests that repositioning is usually more prioritized over rolling, as hunters usually have more windows to attack. Another way of dealing with monsters attack is guarding. Generally, you don't guard when a monsters attack deal too much knockback. High knockback generally equals to receiving high damage plus long recovery animation. Then again, guard is generally used as a corrective action to compensate for a hunter's bad dodging skills, which is not ideal for most cases. Unless you are using lance or charge blade, there are situations where guarding can be optimal. Finally, Hyper Armor is useful in dealing with monsters attack as it negates most form of knockback while receiving reduced damage. It basically allows you to trade damage with the monster, well, in short, rock steady mantle. We'll talk more about Hyper Armor later on. Alright, so that concludes the part of not getting attacked by monster. Now let's talk about the part of where the hunter is attacking the monster. Obviously we have to first get close to the monster within the hunter's attack range or critical distance. This involves effective puffing, which are horizontal, vertical, and diagonal puffing. Starting with horizontal puffing, you actually don't get close to the monster by horizontal puffing. But what this do is that you bait the monster charge towards you, and then you get to hit the monster right after. Uh, it's actually not really a form of bait. It really depends on what the monster is doing. If it's charging towards you, then yeah, you can just do this, right? You can just move horizontally and attack the monster later on. So yeah, the other one would be vertical puffing, which you just charge towards the monster. Well, obviously this is the fastest way towards the monster, but also the monster will actually attack you like on a straight line. Most of the monster's attack is actually tracking your hunter and then attack it on the straight line. So this also suggests that getting close to the monster with the most efficient puffing will actually lead to you getting attacked. So this is where the diagonal puffing comes into play. So let's say the monster track against you right here, and then you move diagonally. The monster is attacked here, and you are closer to the monster. Whereas it's way better than the monster track against you, you move horizontally, and the monster attack here. And obviously it's going to be a longer puffing because it's an L shape. Alright, so once you get close to the monster, the effective puffing for this part is actually moving around the monster because uh, you are able to dodge the tracking effectively but also um, maintain within attack distance with the monster. So you are always within the attack distance and you are able to get good DPS uptime. But then again, uh, just in case that you got hit by the monster and you happen to be still close with the monster, so yeah, you still could move around the monster and yeah, consume potions accordingly because this is generally a safe puffing as well and you don't want to move away from the monster because that's generally results in like DPS loss and it's not necessarily safer as well so yeah, the circle puffing is what you do once you are close to the monster Alright, now let's talk about how the attack window is being calculated in a hunt the idea of attack window is to actually attack the monster safely without leaving yourself in danger. It's actually calculated based on distance between monster hunter, monster state, hunter state. To be more specific, monster state equals to monster's default state and monster's free hit state. Monster's default state is what monster does to reset its state after an attack. It's like a recovery animation for the monster after an attack which basically means a monster's opening. On the other hand, free hit state is when the monster is flinched or toppled. You obviously get to land extra hits during this state. Alright, now moving on to the hunter's state. Hunter's state refers to the hunter's default state, rolling state, and shielding state. Similar to monster, after the hunter completes an attack animation, the hunter will enter into a default state, where the hunter has access to all actions such as moving, shielding weapon, consuming potion, etc. The rolling state, on the other hand, refers to how soon the hunter is able to roll right after an attack. Basically, it suggests that the hunter is safe when he can dodge the attacks during the rolling state. Also, it is important to take note that after an attack, the hunter will enter into the rolling state before default state. Finally, 
Sheeting state refers to whether the hunter's weapon is sheet or unsheet. By having the weapons unsheet, the hunter will have more access to moveset. For instance, spirit thrust into Helmbreaker can be done instantly when unsheet. On the other hand, sheet weapons can only start with unsheet attacks, which may result in lower damage combos within the same monster's opening. Before diving deeper into examples with the appliance of attack window, let's first talk about attack patterns or punish patterns. Hunters should use certain tier of punish or combos depending on the monster's opening. For example, small openings should be punished with C tier attacks, while big openings should be punished with S tier attacks. Alright, now let's use longsword for this context, we will form a combination of attack patterns for longsword. Starting with the lowest tier, C tier, this tier basically involves only one hit. Moving on to B tier, which involves 2-3 to three hits. Now for A tier, we have 4 hit combos or above. From A tier and above, we will actually look into the appliance of attack patterns in actual fights. Moving on to S tier, which involves a large attack window during a monster stopper. Finally, we have Z tier, which I would like to call illegal punish patterns. And here we'll get back into the hyper armor part where we left out. Alright, let's see how hyper armor plays a role in this fight against Zenoga. So right here, I poke and then I special sheet in preparation to EI Spirit Slash. And obviously, Zenoga is doing a flying slam, right? So yeah, let's see if the counter has hyper armor. And this EI Spirit Slash actually has hyper armor. As you can see, I actually managed to deal damage to Zenoga while the attack actually lands on my character. Obviously this has to be timed correctly. And yeah, I received reduced damage and I managed to continue attacking him without getting knocked back. And here once again, EI Spirit Slash. Yeah, supposedly I get hit by that as well, but as you can see I received reduced damage. And I didn't receive any no form of knockback. And here, the other Zack tiers I would like to call Foresight Slash, which involves counter frame. It's supposed to hit me as well, like right here. It's supposed to hit me, but I managed to counter it, and yeah. That's why I like to call illegal, as in, um, you know, you should get hit by the attack, but you didn't end up getting hit. Alright, now that we have established the punish patterns for Longsword, let's compare the difference between intermediate players and experienced players. Alright, let's see this fight with uh, Ascendant Glavinus where he does this Toxic Tail attack. So for intermediate players, they usually go for a 3 hit combo as you can see in here. Which, there's nothing wrong with it, since this is yellow gauge bar, right? I'm assuming that even on red gauge bar, this is what they will do. Okay, let's see from an experienced player point of view. Alright, let's see how experienced player deal with XD Glavinus Toxic Tail moveset. So this is actually a Helmbreaker point. Um, the player first have to do is uh, move forward. Move forward in a way that the attack doesn't land to the player. Like right behind here. It actually doesn't land to the player. And here you do a Spirit Trust. And notice how the distance is quite far. Like the head and the Spirit Trust. It, like, the Spirit Trust will not land on the head right here. But then again, Acidic Glavinous head will move forward and the Spirit Trust will connect. It connects and right here. It actually doesn't guarantee that the Helmbreaker will land on first glance, but right after the Toxic Tail moveset, it's designed in a way that uh, Acidic Glavinous will move forward based on my Hunter's position. 
So yeah, you move forward. So what you do is spirit. I mean, you helm breaker backwards. All right. Now let's look into the fight with Electron and his move set of using Donut Flame. So yeah, this is how the intermediate player deal with this attack. So first of all, you want to get slightly out of it, out of from the flame. Here, the hitbox, initial hitbox is here. You want to get out of it and stay on the second flame. And right here, the first explosion will be on the center and eventually will expand one by one. So you hide on the second one, eventually you get in and you get to attack the monster right away. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with this except that um, it's actually a helm breaker point even though it's yellow gauge but I'm just saying um, intermediate players would probably not make use of it as a helm breaker point. So yeah, let's see how the experienced player deal with this attack. Alright, so similarly to intermediate player, you would want to get out of the first hitbox, the initial hitbox which is on the center, and you would want to get on the second ring. And right here, you get to do a helm breaker right after. Like it actually happens immediately right after you roll, you do a helm breaker right here. Yeah. It will land into the head and the helm breaker connects. So if you notice that um, the head isn't here yet, but you already predict that the head will be here. So yeah, this is also part of uh, understanding the monster's movement. Alright, let's establish the fact that the previously mentioned examples are all safe attack windows where the hunters will not take damage from the monster if the attacks are timed correctly in the right position. Now, we will talk about gamble attack window. I would only suggest using gamble attack window when it has high success rate. To actually know if it's a high success rate, you have to be somewhat familiar with the monster. We will take a deeper dive into AT Valkana's AI for this context. Let's start with establishing the name of AT Valkana's moveset. Alright, now let's look into the flowchart of AT Valkana's moveset where he starts with a tail step. So yeah, starting with the blue path, after a tail step, AT Valkana does a tail spin. This indicates that the third move set he will do is um, Sticky Ice Breath or Charge Ice Beam. But Charge Ice Beam is irrelevant here because uh, as a longsword player, you would position close to AT Valkana where he will do this for sure, Sticky Ice Breath. And this is a Spirit Helm Breaker point. So yeah, for the green puff, um, after a tail step, AT Valkana does a flying tail step. This indicates that the next move set will be a Ring of Ice. And yeah, this is a 2 to 3 hits combo. All right. So moving on to the yellow path where AT Valkana does a tail step for the second move set. This indicates that there are three potential outcomes which are tail step, tail spin or flying tail step for the third move set. So each of these has like two to three hits attack window. But what if I tell you that two out of these three actually has a spirit helm breaker window. So yeah, this is where the gamble actually begins. Let's see how the gamble works against AT Valkana. So starting with a tail step followed by a second tail step. This leads to three potential outcome. The first outcome will be tail step, the third tail step. Here we get a successful helm breaker. For the third move set as a tail spin, you still get a successful helm breaker. But however, if it's a flying tail step for the third follow up, you will be a, it will be a failed spirit helm breaker. So yeah, how this works is that you actually position in the same way that you aim one of these two. It's the same position, but uh, during the landing of the helm breaker, it's somewhat different. Let's see how this works on the video. Alright, let's see how the Gamble Spirit Helm Breaker works against AT Valkana. The first condition, which is the first tail step. Second tail step. So yeah, this is when the Gamble actually begins and I'm already in ready to position to Spirit Trust him. As you can see, I position out of the attack and Spirit Trust. And yeah, before he does the third tail step, it's already telegraphed in a way that this Helm Breaker will be a successful Helm Breaker point. The moment you see this, this telegraphed tail step. I spirit trust right here, and then I helm breaker to the head on the right. So yeah, this is the first helm breaker point. All right, now let's look into another helm breaker point in this gamble. First tail step, second tail step. So this indicates that we are in a good gamble position, and of course, we position out of this attack. And a spirit trust. Yeah, the moment you see his leg rise, like the front leg, you know he's doing a flying tail spin, so yeah, this kind of indicates that this is a successful handbreaker from this point. 
As I poke, his head is going to land on here, so I Helmbreaker to the left. So yeah, similar to the previous one, except that the Helmbreaker point is a bit different. Right, let's look into the failure example. The first tail step, first condition is fulfilled, second tail step, and second condition fulfilled. And obviously I position of it, spirit trust as usual. And yeah, you can see he's doing a flying tail step. It's actually already telegraphed, you know. Like from here on, it's already telegraphed that he will do that. And there's nothing much you can do but accept it as a failure. Alright, so that concludes the part of attack window. Let's talk about some other important attack insights. Alright, now let's talk about animation and stutter cancel. So what it means is that after an attack, it actually takes recovery animation like right here. As you can see, I'm spamming forward button and it, my character is not moving. Because uh, right after the step slash, my hunter is actually picking back up the sword, as you can see. That I do a step slash, I move forward and I'm picking up the sword. I can't move yet. So yeah, this is uh, something you could actually cancel that animation. You can actually cancel that recovery animation by rolling. As you can see what I'm about to do now. I can roll all of it. Attack and roll. I don't have to pick up the sword as you can see previously. The animation cancel also works on weapons where you can actually cancel the attack. So yeah, this is the full attack. You could actually cancel it halfway. Like it didn't spin, I roll out of it. So yeah, this is one of the example. The other example is like the double swing of the hunting horn. That is a full animation of it. You can skip it by only swing it once. So yeah, if you don't skip it by rolling, you will swing twice, right? So yeah, that's another form of animation cancel. Alright, now let's talk about stutter cancel. Okay, I move forward, poke. Yeah, you register immediately as normal, right? So what happens after I roll? Okay, let's see. I roll and then I spam the right click button, which is my poke attack. Nothing happens. I stutter for a while, if you notice. Let's say it one more time. I roll, I smash the right button, right click button. It doesn't register until half a second later. So how do you cancel this stutter? You can actually cancel by just pressing the forward button. Now on this second attempt, there is no stutter. Yeah, let's compare it once again. There's stutter. The second attempt. Now for the second attempt, there is no stutter. Because I smashed the forward button. Yeah, that's basically about stutter cancel. Alright, let's talk about baiting monster's attack. Monster's attack pattern is based on hunter's positioning. So by standing on a certain angle and distance from the monster, you will eliminate the possibility of monster using unfavorable movesets, which directly increases the probability of using favored moveset instead. Let's take Fatalis cone bait for an example. Alright, let's see how the cone bait works. So right here, Fatalis do a line flame, where I am able to get out of it just by walking out. So right here, I'm in a certain range with Fatalis. This is where there's a chance that he might do the cone attack. But let's see what happens. This is one of the potential outcome where he do a triple flame. Yeah, this is not favorable, but we will continue to bait regardless. And he do a line flame, which is another potential outcome. And yeah, right now he's doing a cone attack. And we are already in a position to punish his attack, as you can see right here. So yeah, the idea here is uh, Fatalis will do cone attack when, he, when your hunter is a bit too far. Basically, it's a range attack by Fatalis. And right here, we don't stand too far, but like just in range for the cone attack. And yeah, we are able to get into position right away and punish the attack. So yeah, this is what I mean by baiting attacks. And as you can see, the cone attack actually comes in like a V-shape, because it's a cone shape. Like right here. The attack hitbox is actually a V-shape. That, that's what I'm making use of, where I'm close to the diagonal angle of here. So yeah. Diagonal angle of the right here to be more specific. Alright, let's talk about part break value. Whenever you hit the part break value threshold, the monster will either flinch or topple. So this suggests that you should hit the same spot over and over again to get more topples and claggers, which result in higher DPS uptime. It is also important to take note that hitting over threshold will result in skipping topples and flinches for most cases. Alright, let's see what happens if we keep hitting Teostra's head over and over again. Obviously the hit HP will decrease. And right here, 
as you can see we are about to land the super pound he has 329 hp left and our super pound is 390 so it actually doesn't carry on and as you can see here it resets to 1120 even though technically the 61 damage should carry on right but this is just how the part break threshold works it resets based on the number of attacks you, you are dealing so anyway so the first threshold we hit Teostra actually flinches this is just how the monster works the next threshold would be topple and then the next one would be clagger and this is a cycle and basically it just keeps looping okay we hit the threshold so get the topple right here so the next one would be clagger uh, but actually for hunting horn there's ko value since it's a blunt weapon right so the ko will actually take place uh, will replace the topper as you can see earlier and right here let's say if i attack him immediately what happens is that the part break value of the head will actually reset and he will not get the clagger yeah basically you have to attack while he's on default state but right here is on default state that's why he get the clagger otherwise uh, the monster would just not flinch at all all right as i mentioned the next one will be topper okay let's look into another example all right now let's look into the clagger context we extend the clagger and then we do a full combo right here uh, what end up happening is that you do too much damage and reset the threshold even though the next uh, threshold is topple you don't get it because you didn't land the hit during his default state like right now so yeah ideally you actually might want to um, like right here you don't want to clagger you actually do a full charge slash instead which is like 700 damage and the next threshold will be like 400 ish or 300 ish and then uh, after finish the clagger animation basically it just takes one hit to get the next topple yeah in my opinion that is slightly more ideal so with everything we have discussed in mind we should adapt a wait and see approach while we're attacking the monster so do not fully commit to attacks and always observe the situation this suggests that delayed actions or attacks can be beneficial like monsters do not telegraph its next move set so greedy animation cancel may expose your hunter to danger Therefore, by assuming how you're going to get hit by the monster's next attack will generally result in better decision making. Will you do a delayed roll to iframe or a quick animation cancel roll to safe zone as soon as possible? It is heavily situational, but you will find the answer as you analyze the fight with the attack window concept in mind. Alright, now let's talk about damage modifiers. We will not get too detailed into it, but just a general idea on how to utilize them. There are four main categories for this part, specifically weapon, monster, food and item buffs starting with weapon let's talk about weapon sharpness this only applies for melee weapon and you would always want your weapon to be in good sharpness condition because it is part of the damage modifier as you can see in this table weapon motion value on the other hand refers to the attack motion of your weapon to put it in a simple example it would be right hook hits harder than jab but jab is faster than right hook so the general idea is fast attacks deals lesser motion value than heavy attacks and vice versa. Now, weapon specific buffs do not necessarily apply for all weapons. Like for longsword, you actually receive a damage buff whenever it is coated. Coated as in from white gauge to yellow gauge or yellow gauge to red gauge. Meanwhile, bow guns do not have any weapon specific buffs. So yet, yeah, to make use of it, make sure that you actually go through actual weapon guides. Alright, moving on to the monster. Let's talk about monster's rage modifier. Most monsters receive extra 20% damage whenever they are enraged. While it is true that the monster reacts faster with stronger attack patterns when they are enraged, it is a worth trade-off for the hunter in general. The idea here is to always start the hunt by enraging the monster by making use of clutch claw and slapping the monster's head. There are few ways to effectively enrage the monster depending on your preference and weapon.
Now, monster seed zone values suggest that every monster has a weak spot, so the monster will receive more damage if you hit the weak spot. It is important to note that his zone value works differently across different attack types, which are severe, blunt, and short types. So take Elytron for an example. For severe and blunt, you will deal good damage on the head and front arm. However, for short type attacks, it is ideal to aim the chest and tail for damage. It is also important to note that elemental damage and raw damage have different hit zone value. So let's say you are using elemental bow against electron, you will get a faster elemental KO by aiming head and front arms compared to chest, despite dealing overall lesser damage. Alright, moving on to item buffs. There are three types of stackable item buffs, namely drug type, powder type, and pill type. So you would want to conceal one of each, which is Mega Demon Drug, Demon Powder, and Might Seed. Mega Demon Drug lasts forever until the Hunter cards, while Demon Powder and Might Seed last for 3 minutes. So this suggests that Demon Powder and Might Seed should be rebuffed in every 3 minutes. When the item buffs are able to run out, trading small attack windows for rebuff is always worth it. Finally, for Canteen Food Buff, just eat for attack up large. That's about it. Alright, now let's talk about armor skills. I divided it into 4 main categories which are general primary skills, weapon specific skills, comfy skills, and secondary offensive skills. The idea is to first fulfill general primary skills, followed by weapon specific, comfy, and then finally which is secondary offensive. Disclaimer, this order may not be 100% optimal for all situations as it emphasizes on casual hunting with successful quest clear on mine. Well, since it's going to take forever to explain one skill at a time, so I'll just leave a google doc in the link description. The doc will actually include simple elaboration on each skill and the effective thought process of choosing armor skills, with confidence and DPS in mind. The doc will also include some examples of endgame build along with its general idea. Alright, now let's see what items do you actually bring to the hunt. Starting with healing items, you could actually bring a total of 20 mega potions. So yeah, even though the game indicates that you could only bring a total of 10 mega potions, you could actually bring its complementary item, which is potions and honey. So as you are consuming mega potions to zero, you could actually combine these two into another 10 mega potions, which lead to a total of 20 mega potions. Yeah, so the same way works for everything in here. Let's say max potion, you could only bring three, but you can bring 10 mandragora, 5 mega nutrient, 5 nutrient and 5 honey, which equals to another 5 mega nutrient. So yeah. A total of 10 Mega Nutrient and 10 Mandragora. So this is like the Max Potions complementary item, which equals to a total of 13 Max Potions. The same way for Ancient Potions as well. And obviously you don't actually bring all of this to the hunt, like you choose one of these three usually. Like, this is for early game, right? As you have enough stuffs, you actually bring Max Potions, that would be enough for the hunt. Or you could bring 32 Ancient Potions as well, but generally 13 Max Potions is more than enough. Okay, moving on to buffs, we have Mega Demon Drug, Demon Powder, and Mike Seed. Yeah, I only recommend you bringing attack buffs for this. And then you have Dash Juice, which is for bow or DB users. Then we have Power Charm, Power Talon, Armor Charm, and Armor Talon. Basically, this is a passive buff that you just bring to the hunt, which you don't have to consume it at all. So now, for ammo and coating, it really depends on the ranged weapon that you're playing. If you're playing Pierce, pierce ammo then you have to bring its complementary item as well. Generally speaking it will last throughout the whole hunt with the complementary item. You are able to kill the boss and yeah your ammo won't run out. Except for sticky here. So moving on to hunter tools, traps etc. So traps is like shock trap, pitfall trap, trap tools plus either one of this which will equal to either shock trap or pitfall trap. So thunderbug will bring you to uh, shock trap, net will lead you to pitfall trap. So Trank Bomb is obviously to capture the monster. Then we have Ailment Removal, Null Berry, Antidote, Herbal Medicine, Nastera Jerky, Energy Drink, etc. So for pots, you could bring Dung Pot, which is used to separate monsters within the same area. Let's say there are two monsters up against you. You want monster A to move to another area. So you could shoot the Dung Pot into the monster A and focus on monster B. So for Flash Pot, you actually use it to Dunk Flying Monster. So yeah, it could be useful in some cases. So you could bring a total of 13 flash pot if you wanted to, with its complementary item, flash bug. So for sonic pot, you have the complementary item of scream as well. So sonic pot is actually used to summon diablos out of the sand. Okay, moving on to escape and chase, we have farcaster which is used to go back to the base as soon as possible. So yeah, chances are there are small monsters around you that doesn't allow you to 
fly back to the base, right? So you could just use a forecaster right here. So for smoke bomb, you actually use it to chase, like for example, Fatalis. When the Fatalis, when Fatalis is flying, you could actually smoke bomb and he'll fly down. So IV and smoke knight is the complementary item for smoke bomb. So the other stuff you can bring is like cool drink and hot drink, which is self-explanatory. All right, that's about it. Alright, that concludes the end of the guide. The main intention of this whole video is actually to influence more players to play the game with the right intent, rather than mindlessly. Happy hunting and thank you for watching. Peace out.